What is the purpose of war, according to Vitell? Book 3, Chapter 8, Section 136. The end of a just war is to avenge or prevent injury that is to say, to obtain justice by force, when not obtainable by any other method, to compel an unjust adversary to repair an injury already done, or give us securities against any wrong with which we are threatened by him. As soon, therefore, as we have declared war, we have a right to do against the enemy whatever we find necessary for the attainment of that end, for the purpose of bringing him to reason, and obtaining justice and security from him. While Hamas has a base in Gaza and Gaza is right next to Israel, there is no way for Israel to obtain justice and security against its enemy besides conquering Gaza and either replacing its government completely, or moving the people elsewhere, or both. One reason mowing the law and making war to punish the Arabs, feels so viscerally wrong is that it is not, in fact, a way for Israel to obtain justice and security against its enemy, except with the hope that hurting Hamas and Gaza will teach them the error of their ways. History teaches us that this punishment does not work, making Israel's tactics wrong, not because they are too harsh, but because they are too weak. The problem with punishing the Arabs is that it strengthens American support for the Arabs, which more than counteracts the intended effect on Arab morale. The only true law of war is, if it hurts people and doesn't work, don't do it. Of course, there are some situations where avenging the wrong is sufficient to prevent any recurrence of the wrong. This is clearly not one of them. Rather, the only way for the Israelis to obtain justice and security from the Gazans after October 7 is to occupy and seize their land, moving them to somewhere where they cannot harm Israel. The idea that this is not militarily straightforward, given the military disparity, is comical. Avenging is not the end, it is only one permissible means toward the end. While it is permissible, it is only permissible if it actually works. Any tactic or strategy that does not work is only a recipe for useless violence. The end of war is always peace, peace on the terms of the strongest party. Justice and security for the victor. International diplomacy aside, the strongest party is clear. Wherever the strongest party is clear, there is no motivation for mutual combat. This simple rule of might makes right, which is always the law of war, is the way in which that the Azeris were allowed, on the basis of basically no reasonable argument so far as I can tell, to ethnically cleanse and seize Nagorno-Karabakh. With almost no physical harm to any of its residents, who just left. Losing their land and property. How much better is that than being bombed? Than having to live in a war zone? Gosh. The Armenians have taken some bad raps, but at least the Armenian cause has never really taken off at Harvard. I think it's because the Armenians are already Christian, sort of, which is weird, and deranges the whole missionary impulse. Basically, the blame for Israel's tactics falls on the international community, aka the State Department, because mowing the lawn is the only action that state permits. Other than bend over and take it, or, in the longer term, the coffin or the suitcase. Since mowing the lawn is not an effective military tactic, it is not morally acceptable. One wonders if the Gaza protesters are sensing this in some way. Not probably not. But is conquest of territory an okay thing to do? Book 3, Chapter 13, Section 194. If he has to do with a perfidious, restless, and dangerous enemy, he will, by way of punishment, deprive him of some of his towns or provinces, and keep them to serve as a barrier to his own dominions. Nothing is more allowable than to weaken an enemy who has rendered himself suspected and formidable. The lawful end of punishment is future security. Sounds sane and normal to me. Does conquest create a right of ownership? Can Israel conquer Gaza, then turn it over to Jared Kushner to redevelop? Sure thing, bro. By the rules of the voluntary law of nations, every regular war is on both sides accounted just, as to its effects, and no one has a right to judge a nation, respecting the unreasonableness of her claims, or what she thinks necessary for her own safety. Every acquisition, therefore, which has been made in regular warfare, is valid according to the voluntary law of nations, independently of the justice of the cause, and the reasons which may have induced the conqueror to assume the property of what he has taken. Accordingly, nations have ever esteemed conquest a lawful title, and that title has seldom been disputed. What is the most aggressive response Israel would be justified in taking in response to October 7? According to the most genteel classical international law, as perfected in the days of pretty little cabinet wars with dripped-out dress uniforms and trumpeters who played Bach, Book 3, Chapter 8, Section 141. There is, however, one case, in which we may refuse to spare the life of an enemy who surrenders, or to allow any capitulation to a town reduced to the last extremity. It is when that enemy has been guilty of some enormous breach of the law of nations, and particularly when he has violated the laws of war. 
This refusal of quarter is no natural consequence of the war, but a punishment for his crime, a punishment which the injured party has a right to inflict. But in order that it be justly inflicted, it must fall on the guilty. When we are at war with a savage nation, who observe no rules, and never give quarter, we may punish them in the persons of any of their people whom we take, these belonging to the number of the guilty, and endeavor, by this rigorous proceeding, to force them to respect the laws of humanity. Just by fighting without uniforms, let alone all that Cray Comanche tear slaughtering, Hamas fighters have entered this legal territory, which survives in Guat parlance as the illegal combatant. The IDF has the right, if not the duty, to execute all its captives on the battlefield. But what about the civilians? Section 148. But all those enemies thus subdued or disarmed, whom the principles of humanity oblige him to spare, all those persons belonging to the opposite party, even the women and children, he may lawfully secure and make prisoners, either with a view to prevent them from taking up arms again, or for the purpose of weakening the enemy. The IDF has the right to invade Gaza, shoot all the Hamas militants, who have given up their rights under the law of war, and detain all the civilians. This is how it works. No one in any other time would have questioned this as a normal result of war. Actually, even letting all the civilians out of the Hamas fortress is kind of generous. By the polished nations of Europe, women and children are suffered to enjoy perfect security, and allowed permission to withdraw wherever they please. But this moderation, this politeness, though undoubtedly commendable, is not in itself absolutely obligatory, and if a general thinks fit to supersede it, he cannot be justly accused of violating the laws of war. If there are hopes of reducing by famine a strong place of which it is very important to gain possession, the useless mouths are not permitted to come out. And in this there is nothing which is not authorized by the laws of war. In other words, if their plan is to starve Hamas out, a very solid military plan, given the geography, the IDF is actually authorized, by the laws of war, to keep the Gazans in, so that the women and children compete for food with their husbands and fathers. Caesar, of course, did this at Alicia. Worked like a charm. What is the best way to peacefully govern a captured territory? According to reality, the occupying power should win hearts and minds. According to history or at least according to Vitell, the proper technique is quite different. A conqueror who has taken up arms, not only against the sovereign, but against the nation herself, and whose intention it was to subdue a fierce and savage people, and once for all to reduce an obstinate enemy, such a conqueror may with justice lay burthens on the conquered nation, both as a compensation for the expenses of the war, and as a punishment. He may, according to the degree of indocility apparent in their disposition, govern them with a tighter rein, so as to curb and subdue their impetuous spirit, he may even, if necessary, keep them for some time in a kind of slavery. He said it. He said the S-word. Emmerich de Vittel, this colonialist, is actually licensing Israel to enslave the Gazans. Who are certainly fierce, savage, impetuous and indocile. But why would that work? Wouldn't that just make them more angry? Don't you have to do the opposite win hearts and minds? Oddly, old Emmerich doesn't see it that way. But this forced condition ought to cease from the moment the danger is over, the moment the conquered people are become citizens, for then the right of conquest is at an end, so far as relates to the pursuit of those rigorous measures, since the conqueror no longer finds it necessary to use extraordinary precautions for his own defense and safety. Then at length everything is to be rendered conformable to the rules of a wise government, and the duties of a good prince. No paragraph could make clearer the difference between the old historical political science, which actually worked, and the new realistic political science, which is bogus. Actually, even when the 20th century needed to do a conquest that worked, it forgot about hearts and minds and did it the solid Vittel way. Look at post-1945 Germany. Complete with forced labor, e, slavery. You see, Sam, it really is all connected. Is it not astounding how Vittel, one of the great legal minds and scholars of statecraft of his day, simply assumes that any government can rule any people? The power and majesty of any state, Vittel believes, can reconcile any population to its affections. A Catholic prince can govern Protestants, a Protestant prince can rule Catholics. And of course the language and race of the prince need not even match the population. As late as the 19th century, the Greeks imported a German king. For this reason, Vittel does not really cover ethnic relocation policies, unless they concern the relocation of savage populations which do not obey the civic law of war. Vittel would consider this another incentive in favor of civilization and civilized war. In every war, the rules are mutual. They sink to the lowest standard of either side. If you are at war with Comanches, you are licensed to use the methods of Comanches, but never just because they make you feel warm and good, 
only if they actually work, and nothing less nasty does. Vital is a recipe for peace, not endless asymmetric wars. Note that in the early days of Israel it was thought that a Jewish government could rule Arabs, which is why Arab Israelis became normal Israeli citizens. Later a war of conquest was forced on Israel, but after these conquests it proved impossible, for demographic reasons and general national sanity, to digest Judea and Samaria and Gaza in this way. Yet for a long time they could still be under colonial government. Then the US hatched the crazy scheme of the PLO's return from Tunisia, and in that power vacuum, Hamas, an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, seized control of Gaza. This clock cannot be turned back. Israel cannot recolonize Gaza. One illusion that died with the paraglider assault on the rave was Jabotinsky's idea of the Iron Wall. Fundamentally, any wall has a two-dimensional quality. While it is probably possible to make a wall better than the Iron Wall that Israel had up, which was basically a chain-link tennis fence with some ring doorbell cameras, modern warfare operates in three dimensions. Any wall will always be too short. No act of vengeance is adequate. The problem of governing these artificial, Byronic Comanches needs to be solved. Hamas has turned Gaza into a fortress. If Israel decides to act according to history, not reality, and obey the natural laws of Vittel, not the weird whims and whimsies of the increasingly demented American progressive elite, here is what it will do with this fortress. Israel will recognize that the Gaza Strip is a besieged city and offer to evacuate its population, who will walk out in single file along the beach, with their hands up. Anyone who stays is either a martyr or a hostage and will be treated as such. Anyone who emerges is safe unless he has committed war crimes, in which case he is a martyr. Israel, which has a lot of land, will build secure temporary housing for 2 million people in the desert, and pursue moving them to a charter city in someone else's desert, or maybe even jungle, or perhaps if Elon can guarantee a safe journey Mars. Hamas has a lot of energy, what if they put it into colonizing Mars? Just a thought. If the residents of this new post-Gaza have a valid ticket anywhere else in the galaxy, they can go there. Otherwise they stay in secure temporary housing. They can still go to the beach, in VR. The Palestinian people are safe. The Palestinian cause is finished. Imagine you have a friend in Gaza. You could give them their present experience. Or, by pressing a button, you can give them this experience. Why not press the button for everyone? What is stopping you? Is it not your own vanity and or ambition? It is not at all too late to choose the Palestinian people over the Palestinian cause. For the West, the way to make this choice is a policy of neutrality, the normal foreign policy of the age of Vittel. Do not give money, lend money, or sell arms to either side. We see instantly that neutrality equates to letting the Israelis just expel the Gazans, a fate their collective support of October 7th has collectively earned them. Va Victus. But the IDF will have to do it with their own homemade Uzis. I think they would? Of course, it's totally up to them. One of the perverse pleasures of this solution is that it is not just far to the right of the Israeli right, but also far to the left of the American left. Who are not, yet, seriously thinking about banning US investment in Israel, unless your name is Harvard. Actually, one strain of criticism of early 20th century internationalism was that it was deeply driven by international finance. US lending to Britain and France was indeed a major cause of US entry into the war. In Vittel's era, international finance was weakly developed. Today he would see it as a dangerous compromise of national sovereignty, as one of Washington's foreign entanglements. A nation that does not borrow or lend internationally, that pays for all its imports with revenue from exports, and does not allow cross-border capital flows, can obviously be much more independent than one which does. Still greater levels of independence come from self-sufficiency in energy, resources, food and technology. The cost of exporting technology for America, a creative country, has been immense. America is growing dangerously dependent on China. But its independence is pretty strong compared to Israel's. The early Israel put a lot of work into real independence. The early Israel was a country, not a resort. Can a resort defend itself? A tax haven? Even a real estate development? Having not only your own language, but even your own alphabet, is quite a piece of independence. But not, I fear, enough.